At the beginning of the Triassic period, there is no grass, there are no ice caps, and the third of the planet, not covered by the vast Panthalassa Ocean, is occupied by one supercontinent called Pangaea, or All Earth. 95% of all life on Earth has just been wiped out by the Permian mass extinction. It is an event which dwarfs the catastrophe, which will end the reign of the dinosaurs almost 200 million years later. For as long as there has been life on Earth, such mass extinctions have been a common feature. The vast majority of life on this planet ends, leaving the survivors to scrabble a meager existence in whatever way they can. Two of these events surround the Mesozoic era, the time of the dinosaurs. Postosuchus is the king of carnivores in the Triassic, big and powerful enough to take down the largest reptiles. It's likely that the main dish on the menu for Postosuchus will have been the lumbering herbivore Placidius, as this imposing archosaur lies in wait to ambush lunch rather than expend much needed energy in a chase. Nothing is safe from Postosuchus, and the only thing it has to fear is another of its kind. Several remains have been found in the petrified forest in Arizona and the post quarry in Texas, both in the USA. A postosuchus will have to control a large area of land if it is to find quarry enough to survive. Postosuchus has straight legs directly beneath its body, longer at the back, suggesting it has recourse to speed when necessary. This might explain the pseudonym of running crocodile. There is a school of thought who believe that Postosuchus runs on two legs, rather like the Allosaurus of the Jurassic. They are, however, in the minority. Cynodonts are largely nocturnal, hiding in burrows by day and only venturing out at night when such creatures as Coelophysis sleep. Forty individual fossils were found just southeast of the petrified forest in St. John's, Arizona, suggesting the herding instinct of these ancient reptiles. With no teeth to grind the roots and rough vegetation stapled to their diet, Placerius relies upon the matter fermenting within their huge guts to release the nutrients. Consequently, the waste gas produced will cause a rumbling of a kind only heard today in the middle of the most tumultuous thunderstorm.
An opportunist, Coelophysis eats anything available, from eggs to lizards to fish to carrion. No, no, no. Try again. That's correct. First class. That is clearly wrong. First class. You're an evolutionary marvel. That's correct. You're an evolutionary marvel. First class. That's it. You've recreated a Coelophysis fossil. These creatures do not simply fling themselves from cliff tops, but actually fly by flapping their wings. Later, larger pterosaurs like Ornithochirus will rely more on thermal updrafts to glide vast distances. Prosauropods are the first dinosaurs to feed exclusively on plant matter. For many years, paleontologists will think that the small heads and tiny teeth of these dinosaurs prevented the consumption of anything but the softest aquatic plants. Far more likely is that they reach high up into the trees where the leaves are tender and out of reach of other plant eaters. Very good. They'll need a nap after such a feast.
Though the adult Ramphorhynchus will live entirely on fish it plucks from the ocean with its needle-like teeth, the immature pterosaur will focus on the insects to be found on land, emulating their elders as they grow in size and competence. The adults, however, will swoop low over the surface of the water, grab a fish, and deposit its catch within a baggy throat pouch, still visible in some fossils. With unmistakable plates running the length of its body and four vicious meter-long spikes at the tip of the tail. As if these plates aren't protection enough, a series of bones beneath the throat acts like chainmail. The Jurassic period begins with a mass extinction of which little is known, except that many species, both on land and in the sea, vanish from existence. Pangaea now begins to break up, with what will become North America beginning its rotating journey northwest, away from Africa. This is a movement which continues to this day. In the seas, reefs of coral grow as ammonites and belemnites begin the painful evolution into squid and other species. Sponges, sea lilies, sea fans, sea pens, and sea mats colonize the surface of rocks, and above it all flies the first bird, Archaeopteryx. The land becomes wetter with ferns and conifers dominating the landscape. Higher latitudes see redwoods and ginkgo gradually expanding with scramble ferns, benetites, seed ferns, maidenhair, conifers and cycads filling the world with a color and quality never seen before. Beetles, wasps and flies begin to fill the air, while mutes and lizards take their first faltering steps. All this change and development creates the ideal environment for the continued evolution of the dinosaurs. Food is plentiful for the sauropods, huge herbivores needing a ton of vegetation per day, and with more herbivores spreading across the globe, the carnivores also have no shortage of free meals. Everything is in place for the growth and proliferation of the species who wants it most. In the Jurassic period, this means dinosaur. Eustreptospondylus may provide a link between early Jurassic <laughs> Little is known of this bipedal carnivore. Fossil finds are limited to a sole example, but even with such scant evidence, we can be sure that Eustreptospondylus is an active flesh eater and undoubtedly also a scavenger. In tune with other theropods, Eustreptospondylus is probably fiercely independent, willing to fight to the death over scraps of food with another of its kind. The powerful hind legs, toothy head and weak forelimbs are typical features of the theropods, already developing into what will be their ultimate form as the perfect killing machine, the Tyrannosaurus. Lyopleurodon will quite simply eat anything that swims. This enormous predator is the scourge of the Jurassic Ocean.
To enable them to stay submerged with lungs full of air, Cryptoclidus must take on pebbles from the seabed as ballast to sift burrowing animals from the mud. Such is the great weight of Diplodocus that the pelvic bones of the females are fused together lest the male should crush them during mating. Essentially a huge eating machine, the gut of the Diplodocus holds over half a ton of vegetation fodder for the dung beetles, which will outlive them by over 100 million years. Longest of the sauropods, Diplodocus has a relatively light build considering its size. Balancing its almost endless body over sturdy legs like a suspension bridge, huge ligaments running down its back take the strain of the long neck and tail. Diplodocus is unable to move its head in anything but sweeping curves, never more than 90 degrees, giving it a wide feeding arc. The swan-like impression of this creature which will be favoured during the early days of paleontology is quite impossible. Its food has to be obtained at head height, the tops of the trees being the sole province of Brachiosaurus. It is not known whether Allosaurus hunts alone or in packs, but considering the giant sizes or the dying sauropods that have strayed from the herd. Brachiosaurus needs to consume vast quantities of conifer leaves plucked from the tops of the trees, needing over two tons of food per day to survive. For an adult male human, this would mean a regular routine of consuming over six pounds of fruit and conifer leaves every day. You'll never make a paleontologist. You're an evolutionary dead end. Excellent. You know what you're doing, don't you? You're an evolutionary marvel. Well done. You're an evolutionary dead end. Quite right. That's correct.
very good. You certainly know your dinosaurs. That's it. You've recreated a Stegosaurus fossil. Though probably more used to scavenging carrion, lizards and small mammals make short work of such a defenseless creature as a newborn Diplodocus. You're an evolutionary marvel. That's great. Make yourself a toasted Plateosaurus sandwich. Pangaea has split into two vast continents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana to the south. Huge granite pinnacles mounted on 60 meter high outcrops mark the coast, the air filled with spray from blowholes. Pterosaurs rest here, taking wing on the thermals before diving towards the ocean to snatch at an unwary school of fish. Inland, the vast marshes are divided by a landscape decorated by the usual conifers, ferns and podocarp, the first flowering plants adding colour where before all was brown and green. These flowering plants will soon dominate the landscape within lush, dense forests of southern beech, pines, redwoods and araucaria trees. Aphids, bees and wasps begin to fill the air in thick swarms, providing a plentiful food supply for the flocks of birds already establishing themselves as potential masters of the sky. During the Cretaceous stalk the latest branch of dinosaurs, huge creatures who have so far successfully negotiated their way through the evolutionary minefield. Tyrannosaurus stride through the forests, eating anything that moves, while herds of Anato Titan graze next to the magnificently crested Torosaurus. While some creatures graze and others fight amongst themselves for territory, they are blissfully unaware that all is soon to end. The cataclysm which will curtail the reign of dinosaurs and remove them from the face of the earth is approaching. The Cretaceous period will see the end of the Mesozoic era and with it the dinosaurs. What might they have become, given just a few more million? Kulasukas is a carnivore and a scavenger. In the water, it is a fearsome hunter. Kulasukas eats anything it can catch and hold in its jaws, even an incautious Lielinosaura. Kulasukas is a large amphibian from the Temnospondyls group. With a large skull and weighing half a ton, Kulasukas is certainly one of the strangest creatures to exist in the Cretaceous period. 80 centimeter jaws hold teeth up to 10 centimeters long, making this amphibian a dangerous hunter in the water, used to lying in ambush on the river bed as the unwary victim approaches. The jaws will snap shut and the prey is dragged under the water to drown. Rather than adopt the two-legged running stance of the Iguanodon,
Ornithocyrus normally catches its prey by plunging its huge toothy beak into the ocean. Closely related to the Hypsilophodontids, Lielinosaura are small bird-hipped herbivores living on the forest floor. It may be that the dwarf allosaur has survived its forebear by adapting to the harsh conditions in the southern polar regions. To help it balance on one foot while kicking, its tail acts like an acrobat's balancing pole, being stiffened by a sheath of fine bony rods. Swinging in a wide arc, its huge 20 cm slashing claw can produce terrible wounds, enabling a Utah raptor to cripple and kill animals much larger than itself. The discovery of a number of skeletons of the closely related Dromiosaur Dianonychus around the skeleton of a large plant eater suggests that dromaeosaurs may well have hunted in packs. The dinosaurs are turning in their graves. That is clearly wrong. You certainly know your dinosaurs. That's correct. First class. You're an evolutionary marvel.
first class. First class. That's it. You've recreated a Tyrannosaurus fossil. Didelphodon is a scavenger first and last. Small reptiles, insects, carrion, and probably most of all, dinosaur eggs, provide a healthy larder for this badger-sized mammal. Excellent vision and sense of smell might give this animal the necessary advantage in this period, enabling it to detect sources of food and threat at some distance. That's correct. That's clearly not the case. First class. You've successfully fed them all. That is clearly wrong. That's correct. You certainly know your dinosaurs. Whoops. Have another go. Excellent. You know what you're doing, don't you? That's correct. Excellent. You know what you're doing, don't you? Very good. Excellent. You know what you're doing, don't you? Well done. You've completed the tree. Longer teeth, a larger head, more powerful legs. Almost everything about Tyrannosaurus is bigger and more dangerous than earlier theropods like Allosaurus. One of the most proficient predators in history, it is exclusively carnivorous, needing to consume a huge amount of flesh to survive. Huge jaws filled with teeth longer than a man's hand can tear chunks of meat up to 70 pounds in weight from a fresh kill. Tyrannosaurus cannot chew, so meat must be swallowed whole. This can lead to disaster. Fossil remains show that at least one Tyrannosaurus died in the act of swallowing, 
with two huge bones stuck in its throat. The first reasonably complete Tyrannosaurus skeleton was discovered by paleontologist Barnum Brown in Hell Creek, Montana, in the USA, in 1902. Until this find, only fragments had been unearthed. In all, over 20 individuals have been found, although only three have complete skulls. Remains have been discovered from Alberta and Saskatchewan in Canada to New Mexico, Montana, Texas, Utah, and Wyoming in the USA. Remains have also been found in Mongolia. Fossil finds have confirmed the confrontational nature of Tyrannosaurus, with Tyrannosaurus teeth found embedded in a Tyrannosaurus ribcage. Vertebrae have been found bitten in half, with some vertebral bones missing. As the only dinosaur capable of biting through the bone of a Tyrannosaurus was another Tyrannosaurus. This demonstrates that not You certainly know your dinosaurs. First class. That's correct. Here's some coprolites, or fossil dung, from plant-eating dinosaur. Now, they don't look like much, but you can see lots of bits of chopped up plant material in here. But I think what's even more exciting is that they also give us a glimpse of the interactions of dinosaurs with other organisms in the ecosystem.